Hey YouTubers, I want to do something a little bit different today. I'm going to be doing an analysis on Stray Cat Strut. There's a great tutorial out there, uh, I believe it's by Your Guitar Sage. Um, it's, uh, it's a great tutorial, I have no need necessarily to do a tutorial myself. If you guys want to see a tutorial, tutorial from me, um, just let me know if there's enough demand for it, I'll do one. But believe me, the one that's out there is really good. Where I want to come in on this one is um, a little bit of theoretical analysis. I want to talk about what makes this song cook. If you're here, if you know this tune, you'll probably remember one of the first times you heard it and it just blew your mind in terms of colours and note choices and some really cool stuff going on. So that's what I want to dig into today. Um, before I go any further, I want to quickly mention some, some of my newest Patreon members, Derek Lee Goodread, we've got Patrick McKenney, we've got Rocky Henderson, and Kyle Andrews. Now, Kyle Andrews, Derek Lee Goodread, and Rocky Henderson are on the highest tier. You guys, um, you'll be getting a lot of mentions. Thank you for that. Um, but of course, I want to thank all of my Patreons. It's brought to you by you. I'm working much harder and putting more time in. I've got a cool light now. Hope you notice the light's a little bit different. So um, that's something I promised I'd do when I reach uh, a Patreon goal, and I have. Um, so yeah, moving right along. Very exciting times. Let's get into the work. So, we've got the intro. And by the way, in terms of the guitar tone, I will do a video just purely on the guitar tone. Um, that's going to be a bonus video for Patreon members. But of course, this is free to you guys on YouTube to watch and enjoy. Um, unless you want the transcription, that's on the Patreon. Check that out as well. Enough about that. So let's have a very close look now at what's going on there in that first couple notes. So much cool stuff already is going on. Um, the, the first two notes is a double stop. There's nothing too complex about that, the whole Chuck Berry thing. <laughs> That's great. Bit of pentatonic. Okay, cool. Your ears are enjoying this, but when it really starts to get interesting. Yes. So guys, what is that? What the heck is that? And how do you think of that? Um, I can't tell you whether Brian Setzer had maybe just learnt an augmented scale in a guitar lesson at some point, or had just stumbled across it, or maybe he learnt it a few years back. Um, maybe it's something he had a full grasp on. I, grasp on. I'm not sure. I'd love to have the conversation with him, but um, this is what I can tell you. So this little riff here, that is called an augmented scale. Now you may have seen in some of my other videos, I talk about a dominant seven chord. If you play in any given key, so if we're in the key of C major, just good old regular C major, and we take our fifth degree, C D E F G. We get a dominant seven chord when we collect the notes up as a chord um, from that point. We get a dominant seven chord. Now, whenever we use uh, that fifth degree, it often has a returning effect. So if I'm playing C, then I play G. It has a nice movement back to that root note. Um, when we start adding other notes from the scale, you get, uh, you get this dominant seven chord, which is exclusive to the key that it's come from. That's getting real wordy and confusing. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, let's try and simplify that a little bit. The key, of, a G seven chord will only be found in the key of C. Okay, so when we play a G seven chord, our ears know that it's gonna take us back to C. Now bear with me because you're probably thinking that sounds nothing like Stray Cat Struck. But what does happen when we play a G7, right, or in or most kinds of G chords, it lends our ear back to C. Now, even if it's C minor, that still works. Right, so this is, as you can see, we're getting a little bit closer now. Because of that, that because there's some form of tension moving from that G7 to that C, or the G, a G to a C, there's some form of resolution, tension can be a really useful tool here and, and what I mean by tension is notes that are a little bit outside or a little bit strange. So let's have a look at the actual G augmented chord. We've got a G, we've got a B, totally cool. Now going to C major, no problems, okay, but going to C minor, that's already quite interesting. Because C minor, if we look at a minor scale from C, doesn't have a B natural, 
However, the little G chord and the little G riff here is using a B natural. And what that does, here's a C minor, here's a B natural. It creates almost that neoclassical tension that... Um, so that's what you're hearing straight away. You're hearing that, that little bit of, um, let's call it neoclassical tension. It doesn't really matter what you call it. It's just putting a name to that face. So then the very next thing that happens, we have an e, uh, the E flat. Now, it's all well and good that the E flat's in C minor, but when we look at that against a G based chord, let's say we come back to the G right back here, G, B, D, the E flat or D sharp now sounds like this. And that sounds really mysterious, but why does it have such forward momentum? Well, let me tell you why, because there's this, this good old augmented scale I mentioned is based on a scale where you just constantly move up one tone or two frets, however you want to look at it, at a time. So watch this. So what's happening there is we're getting a sense of this, this scale that is built by constantly moving up in tones. If only the major scale was like that, everything would be a lot more simple, but it's not. It, this, this creates a really interesting and very distinctive sound. So... Okay, now I'm playing a C sharp there. And uh, in the scale, but we're not actually using a C sharp at this point. Okay, then it goes straight back to a G, which is the root note. But remember that C sharp that I mentioned? Here it is, and then an F, which is there, and then a B, and then that D sharp again. What's your point, Adrian? You're probably saying, no, I don't, I don't generally talk to myself in the third person. That's probably what you're thinking. What's your point? Well, all of those notes are out of a G augmented scale, which works coming back to C because it creates a lot of tension. Um, and another really, and why does it create tension? Just simply because it uses a lot of tones that are, prob that are probably outside of the key that you're returning to, okay? For example, if you look here, we're skipping right past the C natural. That is the root note of the C minor, okay? So that augmented chord kind of actually starts to skip important notes from your overall key, um, leaving holes that then need to be filled in harmonically, if that makes sense. So you can imagine it's like digging some holes um, and then the water comes over the top and fills it in. So this is like the holes, this is the water, filling in those holes again, so. Okay, I hope that's making sense. Basically, uh, just to sum it up real quick, that augmented little run, purely augmented scale. There's nothing outside of the augmented scale in that idea. All those notes there. Okay, so that mysterious sound is an augmented scale. I would probably play around with that scale, um, just playing it straight lines like that. See if you can play it like that. For example, um, it would go three, five, two, four, six, three, five, if we were gonna play it from G. Um, and you might try to work that into your sound. Throw it in there if you don't know what chord to play it from or where to play it, it doesn't matter, just muck around. And I'll explain more later why I'm such a big fan of that because I'm seeing it in this song as well. There's some stuff that doesn't necessarily have to be entirely um, explained, but it sounds really cool. And I think, I feel as though at the time, um, Maybe Mr. Setzer, uh, you know, was experimenting and trying different things, and he found some magic. So moving right along, I hope I haven't gone on too much, but I want you guys to see there's there are ways to, to there are systems and things that you can kind of draw upon to uh, work out what's going on. So next thing we're going to do here is look at the chord progression. So we've got. <laughs> Which I think, by the way, it's really important to have a look at what he's doing with the strumming as well, because that's a really important part. We've also got the little... The little, octave, the little octaves, which sound fantastic. 
Um, I don't think there's too much to get into with those other than the fact that they sound really cool. Going right back to Django Reinhardt, Wes Montgomery and guys like that. Um, Octave sound great and he's utilised them really well here. But let's have a look at the chord progression. So rhythmically... So you'll notice the first time I kind of just strummed through like that. Yeah, it's a bit more laid back the first time. Um, so what, what I'm thinking with this chord progression, I want to point out the little muted notes. I think they're really quite important. So I've got this labelled on the transcript, transcription as riff one. So watch the pulsing of my left hand. This is important. See this? This sort of pulsing motion. I don't know how well you can see that there, but what I'm doing is I'm relaxing that. I think that's important because if you just played it like this, it doesn't sound like Brian Setzer. So rhythmically there, or as far as the rhythm playing goes, a little bit of that relaxing of the left hand is great. I mark this as riff 1A. And that's just a, a slight variation of the rhythm, which I think I was playing for the first part and I wasn't meant to be. My apologies. So for, for, so for riff 1A, down, 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 up. Bring your hand past the strings, right? Or do a dead, what I call a dead strike, because this is important. See that? All those little dead strikes and stuff are really important to capturing that, just that cool rhythm. that in this song and I feel like it's very important. So keep that in mind and just note to the, the direction which I'm strumming. Down, 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 up, down. And I relax the left hands to get that and I come up, okay? Um, so that repeats a couple times. I'm almost just making this a tutorial, so I've got to be careful of that. Um, he hits that. So the actual chords here, uh, let's look at the progression. Why does this progression sound cool? Is there anything interesting in this progression? Well, C minor chord. Now, this is important too. This song is in the key of E flat major slash C minor, okay? Um, I've got heaps of lessons now, or quite a few lessons now, where I talk about major scales, and this is why major scales are so important, because everything is based on or relatable to a major scale. So. This is in the key of E flat, and if we did the E flat chord scale, you may have remembered me teaching, or you will find my videos on major chord scales, where if we were in E flat, E flat's our first chord, F minor is our second, G minor is our third, A flat major is our fourth chord, B flat major is our five chord, or a dominant seven, because very common to that key, then we're at C minor. Okay, now I'm going to stop there because this has covered everything that's important. We start from C minor and it just starts walking down the uh, what we call diatonic chord scale of E flat. Diatonic because, uh, well diatonic means to stay in that one key more or less. Now, we've got C minor, we've got a B flat 7, just regular major scale stuff guys, nothing out of the blue. Okay, you will find these chords in E flat until we get to the A flat 7. We have a dominant seven here, where normally in this fa note family we'd have a, an A flat major or a major seven. Doesn't sound anything like Stray Cat Strut if we don't do anything other than a dominant seven. Did I just double negative that? Did that still make sense? Not sure. Um, so C minor. Okay, so let's just look at that note real quick. That note there is, uh, well, it's, an, it's a G flat, okay? So if we look here, have a look at that. There's two interesting things going on here. Or well, one, I said two, I couldn't think of another, but the one is, that G flat is actually the blues note out of the C minor blues scale. So we are almost, you know, by playing that chord, we're affecting the blues scale, okay? And it's kind of strange because it's almost like, we're affecting the blues scale um, kind of after the fact, you know. Okay. 
fine. So it's you've got this. Um, okay, so you can see there how that blues note um, inside the 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 A flat seven containing that note. Okay, so you can see how that note there, the blues note in C minor, sounds really cool. And it makes sense sort of a little bit more. There it is, there it is. Now let's look at this G7 chord. Why does that sound so cool? Because we have the B natural I talked about before that gives that kind of neoclassical kind of sound. So. That's what's going on there. If I was to combine that into a scale, it's a very kooky sounding scale. We could almost coin it the Stray Cat Strut scale. So I'm playing a blue scale with a natural seven. So it's like mixing a harmonic minor and a blue scale together for you um, theory nerds just like myself. Um, if, you're, if you um, aren't up with that, it's totally cool. You can go away now, and you can look up a blue scale. You can look up, uh, um, you can look up a harmonic minor, and you can probably toy around with what I'm talking about. But just again for the record, eight, eleven, C, E flat, F, G flat, or F sharp, however you want to look at it. G natural, natural seven, C right there. Okay, so that's kind of a little bit of a, um, an interesting breakdown of just why the initial intro. And the chords, chord riff in the song has that really kooky sound. Um, from there, it moves across to... I did tab that, let me just double check, I'm doing the right thing there. So I've just got that as a regular F minor chord. Yeah, regular major chords. Okay, so basically what's happened there is we've taken the initial idea and we've moved it up a fourth just like in a blues, okay? But it's almost as though in a blues, we're just moving the one chord up to the four. In this scenario, it's like we've taken our whole riff, our whole idea from the one chord, from the C minor, and we've moved it up one. So it's strange, it's like a blues really, you know, except there's a whole extended chord movement to follow that step up a fourth degree and what i mean one two uh, one two three four in a major uh, looks the same in a minor one two flat three four okay we've based our whole next progression up from there okay now for whatever reason um mr setzer has decided to just use major chords there not sevenths or anything like that um probably because that's just what he liked the sound of had we started to get into you know, it's it's maybe a little too adding a few too many uh, new interesting flavors um, and too many cooks spoil the broth. And that's another magic thing about this song. Everything is 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 just right. It is, and this is why this song, um, you know, it, it appeals to so many people. It's it's sort of beyond being good for a genre. It's just really cool as it is. And it's the song actually I introduced to a lot of younger students. And they always love it because they can hear something really cool going on. Now, uh, moving right along, I don't think there's too much more to discuss with that. Um, essentially, once we move to F minor, we're using the chord scale from A flat, okay? So it's all, com all sort of relatively moved up. Okay, other than the C chord, that would normally be a C minor. But F has temporarily become our root note, okay? And so we've used C as our dominant seven type or major chord for, for again, the, the effect of a natural seven. You're going natural seven of what? Well, we're in the key of F right now. E is the natural seventh degree of F. Um, in an F minor, we'd have an E flat, but we're getting an E natural, okay? Creates, that always creates it's just simple tension that note resides one semitone away from your root note just move up into our into our root note it just sets it up so that's that now we're going to keep moving along um, 
that pretty much takes us up to the guitar solo. So I know uh, it's sort of like there's a lot of information coming out of my mouth, um, but ultimately there's not a ton of sections to the song. It's almost like in terms of structure, it's fairly simple. There's sort of two parts and then we have this really cool guitar solo. So let's dive into the guitar solo and see what I think makes the guitar solo really cool. So... line. Did I play it right? Oh yeah, I think I might have added an extra note, but the... So, what am I saying there? I mean, initially it's just C minor pentatonic. Yeah, I mean, it's just C pentatonic licks. But what makes it really interesting is these, these pentatonic notes happening over... Okay, sorry, I'm just playing that root note down the bottom and having a little bit of a think about some of the notes that are going on there. Essentially what we've got here is C minor pentatonic and just some regular C minor scale. I think some of the interest comes from the progression underneath more so than the actual notes in the scale. Um, if we play it without the back, you know, given that there's no backing. Um, there's nothing is quite kooky and out there. Again, once we get that, the harmony coming in the back there, you can almost imagine that we've got like a B natural, okay, from that G, G we mentioned before happening while all this is happening as well, like if we went... Okay, so what I'm doing there, I'm playing the B from the G7 chord and just doing regular riffing in C minor and that creates a clash in a sense, but that's a clash that you're going to like or that you will like or do like because at the point here when he goes... There, the harmony our ear already knows because we've heard it so many times in the song, is actually uh, implying a B natural, but we're not playing a B natural, so but it just works. It just does. He's just playing in C minor. So if you learn your major scales and your minor scales, which are the same thing essentially, you can see how you're already getting closer to you know having some ideas. And you can see that this guy's done his homework. Even by this point, he was very young when he wrote this. He'd obviously done a lot of work. He'd obviously learnt scales, learnt a little bit of jazz theory, and, you know, this is the result. So, moving along, um, this next part. Straight minor scale, C minor scale. C, D, E flat, F, G, E flat, D, C. But what I actually really loved about this um, was just the way he skips a note coming back, okay? He doesn't go back to the air. That's a linear stepped minor scale but skipping one note on the way back just makes the whole thing sound so much more interesting. So if you're working on your improvising and you're finding that you uh, feel like you're just playing scales up and down, that's totally okay. You know, just skip a note here and there and suddenly it's so much more musical. But essentially, you know, I have so many students say to me, I just feel like I'm playing scales up and down. That's what soloing kind of is. Oh. This next bit, however, now that is cool. So let me explain what's happening here. I don't know if you recall before, but I mentioned that um, an A flat in the key of E flat would normally be an A flat major seven. So he's actually rolling off the natural seven. That's an A flat major seven arpeggio. Sort of, I'm gonna sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm gonna take a mulligan on this and say, at the end of the day, he's kind of just rolling into the root note. I don't know that it's something you necessarily really have to lock down and say, um, that natural seven is, is a huge thing you would have thought of. It's just kind of sliding in, but watch where it goes. C natural. So this is the root note of A flat. 
the third of A flat, the five of A flat, there's our flat seven, okay? Which is that F sharp or G flat again. So there it is. And then that, this note here, why does this bit sound so damn good? Because he's played from the seventh degree of, of A flat seven and voice led into the seventh degree of a G dominant seven. Okay? Which is the same as the, the note in the G7 chord. So. Okay, so you can see there's a there's you know a lot of theory involved, but then also you know it's all quite you can put a logic to it. If you wanted to go away and, and develop your own style based around this, um, there's there's a few things you can employ, a few devices that you can use. Um, and I'm not putting this out there as a video that's going to just make all this make sense to you and you'll be able to work it out. There's probably a million things you're hearing that may not make sense, um, but maybe it'll pique your interest, okay? So, continuing along, so we have our, our A flat. Flat dominant, it's sort of like a major seven. Goes to a dominant seven, we get a flat seven. And then we land on the flat seven of the G chord. And then we just get this little chord run. And why I really like this bit, just really subtle things, really subtle things. This C minor, okay. See the G natural there? When we move to the B flat six chord, you're going what B flat six? Okay, you get this, uh, you get this thing. So we've got a C minor, then we've got the eighth fret, seventh fret, eighth fret, and sixth fret. See that note there? It's in the C minor. Okay, it's in the B flat six. That creates a really nice continuity between chords when you kind of keep a note um, you might change a note from just a standard chord to keep a note from the last chord so it's like C minor B flat 6 okay and then here we get an A flat 6 okay so this note here is the 6 chord in this this is like a major chord here right like a B flat major get rid of these two play it like an F chord add the 6 1 2 3 4 5 6 then we move it back two frets, it's an A flat six. Then we move everything back except this one. And that is cool. That is continuity at its best between chords. So we've got. That's why personally I think that part just, like you can see in every section of the song there is something there is some glue or some little bit of um, magic dust you sprinkle through the whole thing. I'm getting a little bit fantastical now, but you get the idea. So, continuing along, um, the next part we have is the... Oh, I actually have trouble playing. It's really awkward to play. Wait. Yeah, so, the, okay, so let me explain something. I've been playing this a certain way for many, many years, and then literally this morning when I was just going through this again, I was like, oh, yeah, he does these really big breaking type things. Um, and it's, com it's completely backwards to the way that I would normally play it, in a sense, so forgive me for the roughness there. But if I was going to practice that and work on it, I'd actually just slow it down. What's actually happening here is... <laughs> muted notes I believe upwards up to the eighth fret there with the third finger then picking the sixth fret on the fifth string okay now the important thing here and this is the the part that I fall down on is when you pick down on the on the sixth fret there you've got to continue downwards a little to give yourself room to rake again so we're going So, um, yeah, but guys, you can see when I'm teaching this stuff, um, it's not it's not about 
me and my ego and all that kind of thing, like, hey, I can do this or know this or whatever. It's really um, about what gets me excited when I'm listening to these things and, you know, why it was when I was 13 or 14 and I heard this song that I, I took my, I was staying at my grandparents that weekend and I actually took my guitar with me. It was just a nylon string acoustic at the time. Um, and I was bashing away at it all, you know, for hours that night, trying to, just trying to play something that sounded like this, you know, so anyway, um, so just get going over what we're doing there. So that's the raking, pick the next one. Then we rake to the ninth fret on the fifth string. Then we, then we, uh, and play the seventh fret on the fourth. And then we rake back to the 10th fret on the fourth string. Eight there. Bend there. So you could also play that back here. And then what do we do? We bend. I'm thinking about this. Yeah, sorry. Then we bend from the seven. So, so three, six, four, seven, five, eight. Bend from the seven. Eight. Four, three, you could play it there as well, it sounds quite good. Oh, really can't do this. Okay, so um, aside from the fact that I would need to actually practice that really awkward upwards rake into that spot, which is crazy because it doesn't seem like it's a really complicated thing, but I just haven't done it. And that's, that's the reality. I would have to sit down, slow it down exactly as I tell you guys to do. Um, after you've done that, however you like to do it, um, now, oh, I wanted to explain here about from a theoretical point of view, that is a that is a C diminished scale. And this is why I think it's almost like, um, I, I don't know why I say Mr. Setz, I feel weird saying Brian. You know, I don't know him personally. Um, but uh, this is why I think when, when Brian Setz was young, at the point he wrote this, he was obviously really uh, learning all this stuff at the time, playing around with it. Um, and what he's done here, he's just, he's just used a diminished scale. Straight up diminished scale, a uh, uh, diminished arpeggio, right? So that's a scale that is built on nothing but minor thirds. So we saw at the start of the song, he used this augmented scale that was built on all tones. This is a scale that is built on minor thirds. So a minor third being like a three fret drum. One, two, three. One, two, three. Three, two, three. And at least I got the rakes right that time. Um, so that's, if you played that as a chord, it would be like, imagine we're doing C minor. So it, it's not, um, it's not strictly something that, you know, you will, you will see in the history books that, or, or I've ever seen that's like, hey, you want to resolve something? Use a, use a diminished chord. You know, like if we're in C and we're doing C minor, use it C diminished and then finish with the C minor. It's not something you necessarily see, but it sounds really damn cool. Um, I think more importantly, the way he finishes that lick. Oh. What am I doing? Hang on, I'll do the one I remember. That's really what kind of helps resolve it. Um, just sounds really cool. You know, whether it makes sense or not, it just works. There's something magic about it, it really does work. Um, and it could also be that when we do diminish, uh, diminish scale like that, we get that flat five again. And that flat five always does leave a little bit of tension in, in our ears that will resolve nicely um, to come back to our original minor chord. So that's the only logic I can think there, um, but it really doesn't need any logic. It just sounds really cool. But it is, that's what it is there, guys. That's a diminished scale, a, di a diminished arpeggio. You know? Um, if you hadn't done that, it would have been overplaying. I just felt the need to do that because I couldn't do the rakes before. So I'm clearly compensating. Anyway, moving right along. When that finishes, we got this really nicely harmonized. Yeah, you might have heard that little lick there, but wasn't, you know, maybe you haven't seen that one written down. I don't always see it in other transcriptions that I've seen. Um, so that is just C minor scale, but harmonized C and E flat, D and F, uh, E flat and G, and then into F minor, which these two notes there, 
would be the continuation of the other notes. Okay, part, part of the chord, so. Um, and then in this part here, So what's happening there? It's played something like that. I can't read my transcription from here. Um, yeah, unfortunately with the lockdown, I don't have access to a printer, so I'm working off my laptop uh, as per usual. Um, now, at this point here, you don't have to play a full F minor. Uh, you know. Okay, just those little upper triads. Um, are pretty much what I'm hearing in the recording. I'm not necessarily hearing any of those lower end. So whether he's holding the chord and he's just really working that top end, or whether he's actually um, fretting those as little triads, um, yeah, that one's probably up for debate, but I'm hearing him playing up on those upper three strings. Um, so it's, yeah, uh, it's something easier for you anyway, especially if you're, you know, just getting a grip on these things. Um, theoretically, what's happening here, we're, we're back to the F minor. <laughs> Okay, so what happens there? Um, okay, so this little, just this little lift here. It's just a nice touch. No need to get too far into what's really going on there. It's an F minor. That's the natural second of the, of an F minor scale, okay, or an F major scale, but F minor chord. Okay, um, so that becomes an F sus chord at that point. Um, then we're moving to a C minor triad, so we're going, and that's just a C minor chord like this, but without all the bottom half, just these top three. Um, and this little note here. becomes a C minor 9 chord. It's just a really cool chord. Um, completely diatonic, it's not out of key or anything strange. Okay, just a great sounding chord. So, And then to slide it back, it's just, you're just taking that idea and you're moving back. You can do it with anything guys, it's a really cool little trick. I mean, even in a blues, you know. No problem. I just played an arpeggio, I slid it back. That whole chromaticism thing, where you just take an idea, move it back step, move it back up, it's always gonna sound cool. So that's a little bit of that there as well. Um, this last part here, um, this is really cool. So what happens now, we've got this, uh, it's almost like a little turnaround, okay? Just think of it, think of it like we're in a blues, yeah? So we're on F minor, we're on the four chord. We have a D chord. Okay, so 10, 11, 10, 10. Uh, this one, sorry. Yep, so we've got the D chord. I'll do that again. 10, 11, 10, 10. That's a D dominant 7. Just like this. But we've dropped the bottom two strings. And then we have a G. How did this one go? So this is like a G7 chord. But we don't need the root note, that's the G there. There's the, the major third, flat seven. This is what makes it a dominant seven. This right here is our flat nine, okay? So that's a that's an A flat, or think of it like a G is our root note. This is just one step above, like a G sharp or A flat. That's it there. And then we've got, um, sorry, wrong chord. Um, so we've got B, F, G sharp or A flat. That's the flat nine. And then that right there is a a sharp five, okay? So, and guess what? That sharp five is again a key function of the augmented scale. So that note there, that sharp five, if you learn how to utilize that or understand how to identify it or place it, that will give you that kooky sound nearly every time. So he's used it again. He really obviously liked that tone there. So we had the D7, and we had this G7, 
G7 flat 9 sharp 5. Now, just another side note there, um, the D7, okay, D is the fifth tone, uh, fifth note or degree of the key of G. So by playing a D dominant 7, we are temporarily shifting the ear to the key of G. So that imagine it's like this. D7 belongs to the key of G, so now we want to go to G. But now we play a form of a G7, which belongs to the key of C, which takes us back to the original key, C minor. Again, that whole major minor thing is pretty much interchangeable when it comes to these dominant 7 rules and these 5th degree rules. So we're setting up the G with um, its, you know, its 5th degree chord, which is the D7. And then we're going to the G, we're doing a G7, which takes us to C, okay? All, uh, albeit a very interesting, I don't know how to pronounce that word, but um, albeit, albeit, a, why do I keep using it? A very interesting way to do it with this chord here, which is a, uh, again, the flat nine, sharp five. So that takes us back to this riff. Okay, so that cruises along, um, and then you've got the, the interlude coming up now, so you've got this. And it's really just a C minor triad, but just the top three strings. Uh, then we've got A flat major, top three strings, like an F chord, but that's A flat right there. A flat, C, E flat, A flat. Back to G. Uh, and then it, that repeats four times, and he just moves the idea up. So now we have the C minor, uh, C minor triad from here, and we've got the same thing. Okay, so this here, A flat major again, but in an A form, like think of an A chord, like that would be an A chord. Move it back one, if we drop the lower notes, drop back to the, just like that. Okay, and then he finishes off by going. Okay, and he's got those. Probably a little bit of a rake in there as well. Now, what's going on here? Again, just another version of A flat and G. And then. Same thing as before, okay, and the little slide into the eight, a little bit more of that chromaticism of a C minor, so it's just the top part of C minor. Now I need to see the lick here. I think I remember it, but I won't risk it, so. Okay, so he finishes that little, oh, hang on, with a triplet, little, and this here, Oh my god, it's that psychobilly scale I've talked about before, that whole rockabilly psychobilly scale thing. So it's this here, we've got, um, it's C minor, but this time he uses a different note. C minor would normally go, that one there. But he's going, using A natural, which is more a common feature of a scale we might call Dorian, in fact. I'm not really going to get too far into that one right now. It just, it sounds cool. So he's using a natural six degree instead of a flattened six degree. Um, one, two, flat three, four, five, flat six, flat seven, root note, but he's using the natural six. Um, and to be fair, at this point there, this, this particular lick here is, you know, even by this point, uh, actually by this point, it was the 80s when he recorded this. This was a real uh, Cliff Gallop type. Um, and also uh, Charlie Christian, like Charlie Christian was playing these kind of licks. Um, so yeah, he's taken something that's quite a staple and worked it really nicely there. So pentatonic now. I really like licks where where you're stepping across strings like that. You know, that's real common of guys like Freddie King and Albert King and all those blues guys. You know, um, BB King, um, pretty much anyone with the last name King plays those licks really nicely. So, um, 
again, this is like one of those little passages where there's a plethora of cool things going on. And you can see this guy played a hell of a lot of guitar by the time he even wrote this song. He was, you know, he's he's not, you know, he's who he is for a reason. He's, you know, just great. So we've got the... And then we get that little rake. Which again, another one of those really cool sizzling little factors about this particular tune. Um, from here, we're just back to the... Oh, actually, I think from there, it might even just go back to this. Yep, okay. Apologies. So, everything, anything, everything from that point you already understand, we've been through. We can pretty much just go right to the final lick of the song. Um, which, by the way, I noticed this really cool little thing right at the very end when he goes... A guitar, a guitar dubbed over the top going, which would be the guitar track that was setting up to play the, just, you know, probably the, the final licks, because um, it's kind of got that raw, brighter tone, just sitting over the top of the rhythm track. So you'll just, you'll hear that right at the end. And then you'll hear that. And then obviously the bass does its thing for two bars. And we've got that. And that's the entire song. Okay. So um, the final lick there. Um, just finishes with some pentatonic. But again, don't forget there's a little bit of that natural six. Um, and then he finishes just with a little double stop in terms of the lead part, chords we've already discussed, the very end here. This bit, just a cliche catch cry lick from, you know, way back, you know, it's something that's been used for a long time. But if we look at what it's doing, G, A, B natural, C, back to C in C minor. That's actually a little facet of a scale they call a, a, a melodic minor, okay? So, um, what a melodic minor is, is where you take a minor scale, but you raise the sixth degree, or you, you make it natural, basically, and the seventh degree are natural. You borrow from the major scale, and it just helps you round it off. Okay, I actually hate that scale. Um, not hate the use of it, it sounds great in that sense, but... Uh, but what I believe happened there is you've got a series of notes that resolve really nicely, even in a minor, um, and a lot of classical guys use it, and then people came along and said, let's make a scale where you turn the last part of the scale into that really cool ending people use, and name it a scale. Um, you only ever see it moving in, in that kind of direction, upwards. Um, but it just it's just because it, it tonally resolves back to that root note. Um, but, you know, classical theory is a whole other thing. I never really got into classical theory for um, various reasons, but um, that's it. I mean, there's really not much else to tell you. And then that last chord there, minor nine. So amazingly, if you look at this song, it's got augmented, uh, augmented scale, diminished scale, there's pentatonic, there's just your regular minor, there's a bit of blue scale. Um, and there's, yeah, did I say melodic minor? I think I might have augmented. Um, you know what, I'm starting to run out of puff, guys. I hope you really enjoyed, people. Um, I know it's a quite a different video to just my regular tutorials. If you want me to just shut up and teach it next time, I'm happy to do that, you can let me know. Um, but yeah, please share the video, let me know what you think, check out the Patreon, and I will see you guys next time.